All right, Luis, you got to let us know what god are you killing? Um, did we already talk about Hello everyone and welcome to What We Know. Uh on this show we like to talk to you about stuff that we know and on this particular topic it's absolutely nothing. And so instead, we've decided to bring Luis on. Uh Luis, um you're going to talk to us about Pathfinder lore. Uh, yeah. I'm super excited about this. Yeah, I guess you don't know anything and I do know things, so that's why you brought me I, up. I, I absolutely know nothing. In fact, I rely on um, the Lore Bites episodes that I've been doing. I have been relying on uh, just luck and just pure remembering to do absolutely any of it. I'm sure 90% of them are wrong. So <laughs> I haven't gotten any, oh, this was wrong yet comments, which is really great. Um, so yeah. oh, I can get some of those for you. <laughs> You're like, uh, uh, Phrasma is actually not ashen skin. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, let's, let's, let's start the episode um, by doing some non lore questions, but more Luis questions. Uh, Hi. Uh, why, why lore? Why lore now? Why, why are you interested in lore? Like, what brought Luis into lore? What put Luis on the track to become creative director of rules and lore for Pathfinder? Mm -hmm. Um, I remember distinctly finding an image that I've yet to find since, because, you know, I found it 15, 10, 15 years ago now, uh, that had a picture of the cover of the second adventure path ever for Pathfinder. So the second volume of Rise of the Ruin Lords, and it has these ghouls pulling up a body that's like wrapped in cloth, uh, and it's got a spooky house in the background, and there's lightning, and it looks very scary. And it said, uh, Foxglove Manor, the scariest night you'll ever have in D&D. &D. And I thought, that sounded really cool. What the heck is this? So I tracked down this adventure and then found that it's part of a greater adventure, and I started just sitting down, reading it, you know, page one, that's what you do. And it was telling me about all this world, all about this history of this town, Sandpoint, uh, these, you know, rune lords and these characters. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. I like the story here. I like the world that this is. Uh, and I read more and more about it, read the whole adventure, read the thing in the back that introduces the setting a little bit. This is just kind of a cool world. Wow. I also really hadn't had much experience with pre-written adventures at that point. So my first being Rise of the Rune Lords meant that, like, you know, I got high quality right out of the gate. Um, and it just it was such an interesting world. And I'm like, let's learn more about this. And as I learned more and more about the world of Galarian, it just drew me in. I'm like, this is this is sick. I like this. Uh, I grew up loving stories. I grew up you know, reading books all the time, loving the stories in, in video games and all that stuff. And now here's another world, another medium from which cool stories can happen and just it kind of dovetailed really nicely into like, well, I love stories and, and worlds and everything that comes with that. And now here's a way to more directly interact with them than say like a video game or something. And it just hooked me and I haven't left ever since. Uh, and inevitable Jake fashion, I have questions that are not written on the uh, uh, on notes, <laughs> which is um, when you run a game, um, mm -hmm. do you like to use the official lore or do you come up with yeah. your own lore? No, I, I use I use I run Adventure Pass straight out of the book. Uh, and I mean, I change things, obviously, if an encounter doesn't account for the fact that I have five players instead of four players and stuff like that. And there are even times when uh, my players will ask me questions in the game that i then translate back into stuff that has made it into oh that's cool uh, pathfinder and stuff um so like some of it is like really little things like oh son so and so's so and so player character's name is now mentioned randomly offhand as like an npc in the background of some that's tavern still, or whatever right but like little things like that but um you know it it's just fun to like do the back and forth that comes with that but yeah i i, I play pathfinder even though it's still my job because I still like Pathfinder. Awesome. Sam, do you want to do the next one? Oh, absolutely. Because you mentioned falling in love with a particular piece of lore. Mm -hmm. Is that your favorite or is there some other specific piece of Pathfinder lore that, that you love the most? I guess it depends. And why is a dragon? On... Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends on how specific we want to get, right? Like, could how narrow of 
like is it uh, do you have one particular favorite npc or one favorite monster or one favorite tavern in a favorite city in a favorite nation in a favorite continent right like i don't what comes to mind at the notion it doesn't have to be a singular favorite even but just the knee-jerk reaction one of my favorite things is the harrow which is our in-setting fortune telling deck uh the harrow deck has its origins from way back before i joined with uh paizo uh, but what is really cool about it is there's a lot of interesting imagery and a lot of interesting stories that have been tied up with it. One of my favorite adventures that Paizo's ever published called The Harrowing, written by Crystal, Crystal Frazier, is just like a really fun fairy tale kind of exploration of this deck. And since joining with Paizo, I've had opportunities to like jump in and be like, oh, I get to expand the lore a little bit, put my thumbprint uh, on things. And now that crystal is working elsewhere and most of the people that had a lot of the stronger connections to the harrow i've kind of been like well i will keep taking care of you baby harrow and you know uh making sure your story keeps getting told so i've found myself in a like quasi keeper of the harrow uh uh position at paizo i know a lot about what's going on i wrote for the adventure path that recently came out that's related to the harrow that based a lot of its background on an article i wrote about the harrow a couple of years ago so it's like I'm really swept up in this whole thing and I really enjoy it. And I'm excited to just like keep doing more with that. I think it looks really cool. Uh, you can physically buy a hero deck, right? You can buy cards oh, cool. uh, that are, are the, these, I, these are the older ones. I love that but... you have that ready by the hand. Like, like... <laughs> yeah. So I like the hero. I like the stories connected with it. And I like the potential it has for what adventures and stories can come of it. There's a lot wrapped up into it that I could talk about like, for a whole hour but i know there's other questions at the moment sure uh and and we'll we'll next section of this is uh Mm -hmm. submitted questions and now uh sam and i are going to popcorn back and forth with these questions so that i specifically do not have to read all of your terrible (laughs) terrible handles because you all have just difficult to say uh for the most part uh um uh names so um, the first one, uh, Torak9344 says, mm-hmm. uh, tell me about the Bound Prince, a.k.a. the First Horseman. Is it supposed to be the anar- uh, the Antichrist slash Horseman of Conquest? The So, there in our setting, we have what was referred to as the Four Horsemen, and going forward, we're going to be calling Riders of the Apocalypse. Uh, just because it sounds even more metal that way, I think. Um, so the Riders of the Apocalypse are like the four most powerful demons, which are in older terms kind of a neutral evil set of fiends uh, that are all about just like nihilism and destroying things for the sake of like, they don't want stuff to exist. It sucks, right? Existence is, what's the point? Um, so there's the Horsemen of War and the Horsemen of Death and, you know, stuff you'd kind of expect. But there's stories that there was once a an original horseman before all of this happened uh that the other four decided to beat up and destroy and now he's gone maybe um the question is you know what's up with with this one that what i've been calling now in my head the first writer or the last writer maybe mm-hmm. um is they still exist somewhere they're still alive maybe alive is a a complicated word sometimes (laughs) uh and they kind of in my head the and i actually talked with james jacobs the other creative director for pathfinder about this not too long ago so we can kind of get our ducks in a row about it because there's been a lot of confusing questions about like what's up with them you know did they have a stat block were they originally this creature and now that we're in a remaster we can't use older materials okay well let's let's get everything lined up Make sure what we know the story is going forward. So based on what we've talked about, the first writer is kind of focused on just like oblivion, just the complete destruction of everything, which is above all war, all death, all pestilence and plague and all that stuff. Uh, and what they're up to is yet, has yet to be seen, but they are kind of their own separate entity that like kind of doesn't really care what the other writers are doing, what the other demons are doing. They just kind of, sitting around somewhere i know where but i'm not you know <laughs> i'm keen on keeping that a secret you, you for a can't, while you can't give all the secrets yeah uh sitting around somewhere and maybe has some kind of influence on 
the greater existence uh, of reality has maybe some kind of influence on souls as a result. And maybe we'll be enacting some plans or having some kind of uh, at least a little bit of a, a footprint somewhere in, in maybe future adventure paths. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would only make sense since you mentioned that you were talking to the other creative director that's in charge of Adventure Paths. It kind of yeah, yeah. makes sense, you know. I mean, don't like have expectations that you're going to go kill so, the concept so, of Oblivion. But like, you know, that name will show up at least once or twice in the coming years. Cool. All right. I have a follow up. Yeah. Are these writers... Mm -hmm. Nice to their horsies slash. What yes. do we know about the horsies? Do they like sugar? I bet a number of these horses like sugar. Uh, not probably not the rider of death's horse. Cause I think, I don't know. Do skeletal horses seem like they would like sugar? They, they don't even have tongues when you think about it. I mean, um, my dogs but... like plenty of things that they can't or shouldn't have. <laughs> so maybe skeletal horse. Also a fan. Hey, Jake, if we ever do an adventure path that may or may not include any riders, um, I have thoughts. Okay. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I think the horse, their steeds are quite loyal. Take that as you will, right? Like. All right. Says something uh, good for them. Um, but... In the meantime, before I tunnel in on adorable equines, I should do justice to this question uh, from the shippening. What has Tarbafon been doing all these years instead of rushing Absalom again? And attached questions. Please, for those of us who don't know, define this circumstance in terms. Uh, so what is a Tarbafon? Well, Webster's Dictionary defines Tarbafon as. Um, Tarbafon yes, yes. is uh, one of the main villains of our campaign setting. If you've ever looked at um, most lore books, he shows up in regularity like once every four or five books. We just put another picture up of him up there to be like, there's this guy. He's a lich, and he is a very powerful lich that is involved with the death of uh, a lot of very important figures in our history. Uh, he may or may not be tied to the death of Aridin, who is a god whose greater mysteries, whose death is a greater mystery for the setting. But he's basically the big final boss of the Inner Sea, which is the, the main region for the Lost Omen setting. And Tarbafon, for a long time, for, for hundreds, thousands of years, was trapped in a prison and everyone was watching over him. And then he broke free a couple years ago, back in 2019. And there was a whole adventure path that was dedicated on just like taking away the super weapon that he used to break free and stopping him as best as possible. And he was stopped, but he wasn't outright destroyed. So he went back to lick his wounds and he's been spending the last couple of years amassing forces, doing lots of little things. He's being patient is really what it is. Uh, you'll, you, if you've played some Pathfinder Society scenarios uh, or some other adventures here and there, some of the influence of Tarbafon is still being felt. You'll feel a little bit more of it in the coming year or two, I will say. And uh, he is being patient. As for the Absalom thing, Absalom is the, the main city in the center of the setting where the Starstone lives. The Starstone is the special big chunk of rock from space that if you touch it maybe if you're lucky you'll turn into a god and guess who would like to become a god a big powerful lich during that adventure path he was assaulting uh, or on the way to assault absalom and when the players stop him and now maybe he's realized maybe he needs a little bit more uh thought into doing this now that he doesn't have a super weapon that just lets him break open the walls of the city so again he's being patient but he's not sitting on his hands he's not you know just waiting it out he, he's actually scheming and plotting and you'll be seeing some of that in the coming years that's awesome so um i'll bring on the next question so um the god that you're planning on killing who is it oh i guess have we mentioned watermelon wait wait for real Wait, we haven't mentioned that? No, no. Oh, I, don't, um, I don't think so. I... Don't, don't, don't worry about <laughs> that then. Um, mm. I was just... Mm -hmm. 
Oh. Uh, okay. Can we get another question? Yeah, um, from the uh, Dirk <laughs> Dragon Slayer. Uh, are kobolds going to change along with the dragon remaster? Yes, in ways that I don't think people are expecting. So let me tell you. Uh, so kobolds, prior to the remaster, there's a lot of history of them being connected to dragons. Oh, hey, I'm a kobold with red scales. I'm connected to red dragons. I can breathe fire. And with our changes to dragons, the thing is that we wanted to have that still happen, but we wanted to break kobolds free from the yoke of dragons and not just be connected to dragons. What, what if the, the whole thing being with dragons, you know, there's four traditions of magic. We have arcane, divine, primal, and occult. I just mixed those two in the wrong order. And the thing is, well, if dragons can do that, why can't kobolds do that? Okay, well, if kobolds do that, does it look exactly like a dragon's connection to magic? And we decided, no, let's, let's let kobolds be their own thing. So what you'll be seeing in Player Core 2, once you learn more about them in that book, is that, drag or that kobolds have a connection more to magic mm. than to dragons, specifically. So what happens is if you are a kobold and you have your you know little kobold group, your, your family or whatever, and you're like, hey, we find ourselves kind of drawn to this place out in the woods without realizing that it's a wellspring of like primal magic. And when you have your, your kobolds hatch out of your eggs, they now have that primal potential within them. Or instead you might be drawn to a dryad who lives in that woods and want to hang out near that dryad, one, because she's powerful with magic and you just kind of have an innate connection to that. And two, because she's powerful with magic and she could probably protect your, your family and stuff. So keeping a dryad as your buddy and maybe helping her out and being kind of a, you know, an underling for this dryad may be beneficial, uh, but it, it can be tied to any type of magic. So you might have kobolds that are tied to more primal, more to occult, to divine, to arcane. And some of that might manifest as working with a dragon or another powerful magical creature, or might be growing up in a particularly magical spot, or you might just be kind of a lizard guy that happens to have red scales, right? Like your scales no longer, your, your coloration doesn't necessarily represent mm -hmm. what you do anymore. It's, kind of inside you what matters uh so i i have two follow-ups to that yeah one uh ha ha has that been announced anywhere because i don't no. oh shit. um number two <laughs> <laughs> uh number two i'm it's actually a question that i had for later on but since we start talking about dragons i thought that this was a good fit with him um are is there going to be an introduction or an explanation for the new dragons or is it just going to be like, they've always been like that? And uh, the thing with dragons <laughs> is if you go back to, I don't know, the start of second edition, we put out best year you want and here's 10 dragons. And then we actually first edition is probably a better case. We, we put out best year you want, here's 10 dragons and here's best year you two. Here's five more dragons you've never seen before. We don't just suddenly be like, and then, uh, an event happened in the world and five new dragon types fell out of the sky and filled the world or whatever. Just like these also exist. We just didn't have the time and space to tell you yeah. about them in this last book. The way that if you were to buy a book about animals of the world today, it would have a section about Australia and tell you like 10 animals from Australia, but it wouldn't tell you about every animal in Australia. If you go buy an Australian animals book, you might see more of them. And even that book wouldn't necessarily have all the information if you want to get into birds of australia or fish of australia right and then you know it's just we're limited on what we have so for all intents and purposes these dragons always exist. if you want to say have always existed they've always existed and i'm going to act and all our products going forward are going to act as these have kind of always existed we just have been looking at these other dragons for a while because i don't know we had stats for those but now we have stats for these let's look at these for a while Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I th that one was a question for me, but also I saw it a couple of times where people were like, "Is there going to be like, uh, uh similar to what you what you said of like, you know, a rift has opened and now there are dragons <laughs> coming from other planes of existence that never existed?" But yeah. Okay, great. That's awesome. Yeah. I have a follow up of my own to that effect, since I've I've asked you about cutest, prettiest, loveliest. Dragons, which is the fiercest, most ferociousest dragon? 
I'm going to go with just the eight that we're presenting in the Monster Core again, but probably the Diabolical Dragon, the dragon who's a literal embodiment of hell. So, you know, that one's pretty mean. It, it's uh, a... <laughs> uh, the information there, I'm trying to remember, I wrote up a lot of information for them and not all of it managed to fit. So um, one of the things I remember writing, whether or not it's in Monster Core, oh well, uh, I'm sure you would have learned this eventually, is that um, some people suggest that it's just a dragon whose soul went to hell and then got transformed into this, in, uh, this diabolical dragon. And other people suggest maybe hell itself is kind of alive and it kind of breaks off pieces of itself, shapes those into dragons and uses these dragons to further its will. So I do love that between the cutest and the, the ferocious, both of them divine dragons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you have a direct connection to heaven or direct connection to hell, you tend to be, be very, yes. <laughs> Suppose the dragon can make a hell of heaven of hell and a hell of heaven make, because there are dragons there. But I should ask uh, a a questions that are not exclusively about dragons. Though, who knows, if you're interested in a dragon exclusive, let us know in the comments. But in the meantime, there's a question from our own Krug. How does Erori's doctrine address the potential contradiction of seeking personal perfection in... TTRPG, a cooperative, often team-based adventure. So Irori is to kind of, what's the, whatever. Uh, he is basically the, the, the god of monks in a way. He's the god of history, knowledge, and self-perfection. He's all about you know, perfecting the mind, perfecting the body, perfecting the spirit. And his story is that he was a mortal who did just that and in doing so, reached true enlightenment and ascended to a god. And he's still like, keep it up. Anyone who wants to keep doing that, I'm going to help you out. How do you maintain that while being part of a party? Well, I think being part of a, an adventuring party is just one step along the way of your journey towards perfection, right? If you are some of, uh, someone who's in a party, you, can, you don't have to be absolutely striving 100% for perfection at all times of your day, right? I think even Rory would be like, hey, you have to go learn things. You can't just be like sitting around doing crunches for the rest of your life, right? There's more to, <laughs> to that. Uh, so part of the, the being with other people is learning from other people, going on, on adventures and journeys to go learn about different things, see new places, do different experiences and stuff. So I think it would just be seen as a possible way for your particular journey to perfection to go. And the thing is, everyone has their own particular way that they're going to reach enlightenment and, and achieve perfection. And if that includes going to be with a party for a while and going to stop Tarbafan from destroying all of the inner sea, so be it, right? But you're going to continue on that journey afterward as well. So you can do that if you want. And that's I, I think there wouldn't be any problem with that. Irori understands that, like, this is part of it. But along the way, make sure to, you know, try to keep an open mind, try to learn things and do what you can to refine who you are as a person and, and work towards that perfection. Uh, so I actually have some insight of why I think Krug asked this question, because yeah. our long running campaign, Court of Corvids, he was a monk of Aurori, because like mm -hmm. you do, that's, you know, just life. Um, but there were people within the par the the party that weren't necessarily good characters. In fact, sure. uh, I used a uh, a relic item, uh, a cloak that had an intelligent being, uh, like because you know how uh, there's like an op rules option for the DMs for a relic to level up with people, and one of them is to have like a sentience to it. Uh, to explain it, having a sentience is that I said that it was a demon that was trapped inside of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so. Uh, Krug, uh, there were always moments of which he had uh, very difficult uh, moments to try to like not only just accept but also like move forward with being this being of trying to be a being of perfection while also having a group member in his party that uh, listened to a demon. Okay, but <laughs> perfection isn't inherently good altruistic, yeah, good or evil, yeah. Uh, 
Irori himself up until recently was lawful neutral in alignment and allowed lawful good or lawful evil, right? So you could find your own path to perfection. And if that includes killing everything along the way so you learn, you know, true enlightenment, maybe that's it, right? You but, become perfect by killing everything so that you are the only thing left. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I can see... You know, there's a lot of roleplay potential in that, in that, like, oh, maybe I want to be good and all that stuff, but is that going to get in the way of my enlightenment and my journey and stuff? Maybe. I don't know. As long as you don't skip like day, Aurora yeah, would exactly. describe. <laughs> it definitely would. Uh, next question is coming from Dayton Calendor, which is, <laughs> we're getting a second edition Numenera book? Uh, Numenera is not our game, but I think you mean Numeria. So, Numeria. Oh my, let me just ask <laughs> that question again so that I can just edit that whole out. Uh, Numenary. The next question is going to be from Dayton Calendor, which is, we're getting a second edition Numenera. Did I do it again? You did it again. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to move on and answer this question. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so Numeria uh, are, hey, what if there were barbarians hanging out? out in the wilderness and then suddenly a spaceship landed uh, and crashed in a mountain nearby and robots came out of it land. Uh, we haven't had a chance to go back there partly because we need rules for technology. If we say, let's go to Numeria and we don't have rules for a laser gun so you can use that with your uh, ranger, right? People will be kind of let down. I would be let down, right? Uh, as a player, but also as creative director, be like, I want to make sure we can fight with a laser gun and punch a robot in the face and stuff. And wouldn't you know it, Starfinder 2nd Edition is coming out uh, not, not too long from now, actually. Uh, it keeps getting closer every day. And those rules are going to be compatible with 2nd Edition. And once those are in place, we have what it takes to either steal Starfinder's laser guns or adjust Starfinder's laser guns for our needs or realize, okay, well, here's what Starfinder does for laser guns, and here's what we need them to do for our game, and we'll make ours, and we'll be set. But that is kind of the bottleneck right right now in terms of touching Numeria stuff, any kind of super sci-fi sci technology stuff is, let's see what Starfinder does, because we may not need to do any extra work that we, you know, and just say like, oh, let's just copy paste these, and yeah, here we yeah. go, here's your Numeria book, right? So we'll, it will happen as soon as Starfinder 2nd Edition is, is done, we will start looking into like, all right, now what can we do with Numeria? What can we do with these other places that need this tech? Uh, who Whose arm can we cut off and replace with a cyber arm to, <laughs> in, in the setting so we can make some fun changes, right? I, for one, am totally down for any sort of heist adventure for Pathfinder to steal Starfinder's lasers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> No problem. Simply steals the lesson. Easy. Well, okay, so now that we've talked about Starfinder and we've talked about possibly taking lasers from them, the real question <laughs> is going to be, which god are you killing? Which god are we killing? Um, I know we're killing two orc gods, which is maybe not what people are thinking of when they ask that question, but that's the one that, that comes to mind for me. There's two orc gods that we might kill uh, in the future. Um, maybe three? I don't know. I lost count. There's at least one orc god dying in the future. So have fun with that. Uh, oh. Um. I'm creative. Are there particular directors. customs around, <laughs> around services for, like, is one supposed to bring flowers when an orc god dies? Um, no, I don't think most orc gods would be up for flowers dying. But let me tell you about a thing real quick. A call the crucible. Um, let me bump this microphone all the time. <laughs> uh, the the crucible is a thing in orc belief that when you die with your last breath, if you really wanted to, you could challenge a god and say, "Hey, so and so god, I don't think you're really cool. I think you deserve to be taken down. I you you don't deserve to be a god anymore." and as an orc, you can, like I said, uh, with your final breath or half orc, right? Um, declare this challenge against this particular god and hold that in your heart as you die. The last, you know, few seconds of your life, light goes out of your eyes, um, and then you will find yourself in the afterlife, and that god will be like, "Hey, what's up? I heard you want to fight. 
So you fight this god, and then if you win, that god is absolutely obliterated and destroyed. There's no service because they're gone. There's nowhere to leave flowers for them. Uh, and then you get to be a god in their place. You don't have to be the same god. You don't have to be like, I'm going to go kill the god of cockroaches, and then I'm going to be god of cockroaches. And you're like, no, we don't need a god of cockroaches. Let's kill him. And now I'm going to be god of space lasers, right? Whatever you want. Uh, and if you lose, you're completely obliterated and you can never be brought back. Your soul is completely annihilated and destroyed. But when this happens, an orc's body will gain a particular scar a particular mark on their body and that's when everyone knows hey back off they're undergoing the crucible and then maybe sometime later the the scar will go away and they will there will either be a new god or this person has just gone forever anyway there might be an orc god or two dying in the future i i think it's ironic that you guys name your your system orc uh, and then you kill an orc god, you know, like that's messed up. Well, orc orc is is here. Orcs are here to prove that they're more powerful than anything else out there. So, <laughs> so the remaster challenged the original second edition, and one and a. It's all Maybe. coming together now. <laughs> um, but speaking of elements that are being killed with remaster, we have a question from Arnichi about mm. eliminating alignment to wit whether that frees any of the countries in galarian given that some were particularly yoked to alignment i think it does the way that a player character i'm not going to get into it but in my opinion no one was ever truly like beholden by their alignment to oh, do okay. particular things um a nation never was but um the the idea that Cheliax, for example, kind of has lawful evil tendencies. Tendencies is a light word for what they do. They, they are outright lawful evil. Um, and maybe now under alignment, maybe they do less lawful evil stuff. I think it makes them makes every nation more complex and nuanced in that you can't always predict what a given nation's reaction to a thing is going to be, right? Um, and... Yeah, I think it does open things up. Chalax is one that comes to mind. You know, what are they going to do in the future? Who knows? I knows. Uh, the uh, thing about uh, other nations like Rahadum comes to mind. What are they going to be up to? There's just a lot of more potential, I think. Everything is now kind of in this gray area. That means that, for the most part, you can expect a nation to act in a particular way. But if as long as it's not an enormous departure from from the character of the nation you can make these kind of more interesting choices with with these places and the people that live within them uh for the future which is just i think more liberating and just more fun for for stories and, and potential in the future thanks so much for joining us for what is in fact part one of this interview because there is so much more lore and so many more facts about dragons. So stay tuned for part two coming soon. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed today's episode, give us a like and subscribe and let us know your favorite dragons in the comments below. You can also catch us on twitch.tv slash Althaven, where we stream RPG content. You can join the conversation on our Althaven Discord. And if you want to support us, you can do so on ko-fi.com slash Althaven. So go kill some gods. And until next time, keep it weird, Internet. <laughs>